the key practical teaching of this non-dual tradition is that our mind can be transformed into an instrument of peace and wisdom. This is not just the growth of a deeper understanding, but the uncovering of an innate joy that springs from our own being. And this principle that our mind can be transformed is at the basis of some words given by Swami Ramakirtha, who lived and taught in the early years of the last century. And it's this. The aim and object of life is to keep yourself peaceful and happy, independent of all surrounding circumstances and gain and loss. Keep yourself joyful, joyful, well-pleased and peaceful. To be dejected and gloomy is a religious, social, political and domestic crime. It is at the root of all other crimes. Friends, these words of Swami Ramatirtha may seem too judgmental to, for our taste. After all, surely we can't help sometimes being gloomy. To call that a crime sounds rather uncharitable, uncharitable to say the least. But if we step back a little, we might be able to see that the essential message is not so alien to our experience. For aren't we being reminded of the basic fact that our state of mind influences our environment? And we alone can determine what sort of mind we want to live with. We can carry a light or carry a cloud. If there is such a thing as a collective mood or morale that runs through a family, a society, a nation or a company, it is the result of the mental states projected by the individuals in that group. As individuals, our first responsibility is to ourselves. The first place to be set right is our own heart. Once the heart is right, the benefits are bound to be shared with those around us. And the same point was made long ago by the Chinese sage Confucius when he taught, if there be righteousness in the heart, there will be beauty in character. If there be beauty in the character, there will be harmony in the home. If there be harmony in the home, there will be order in the nation. If there be order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. Discontented hearts are the root source of wider problems. If the heart is at peace, that peace will spread as surely as the fragrance of sandalwood pervades its surroundings. Keep yourself joyful, well-pleased and peaceful. It is easy to voice such positive sentiments and to give out prescriptions for happiness and success. But it can also be counterproductive. It is rather like when we're told by some well-wisher to cheer up at a time when we would rather be serious and thoughtful. Nor is it obvious how to affect an inner uplift of our mood. Some people seem gifted with a tendency to good cheer, while others may smile but rarely. Yet such impressions are shallow and tell us very little. Someone with a breezy and friendly appearance may be superficial and lack real depth. Another person who is quiet and undemonstrative may be gifted with real empathy 
and have a great resources of inner peace and independent joy. One important factor which suggests depth of understanding is that our happiness may be marred by our knowledge of others' pain or of the general sufferings of mankind. Miranda in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, witnesses a shipwreck and she cries out, Oh, I have suffered with those I shall suffer. The cry did knock against my very heart. And her father, Prospero, praises the way her heart is touched by what he calls the very virtue of compassion. Then what is this peace and happiness that we are told is the aim and object of life? Is it based on some deeper insight or realization? If we ask the question, how is it possible to be peaceful and happy? We find there is a relative answer and an absolute answer. What do we mean by a relative answer? In the world, there is a multitude of counselors, each prescribing ways and means to make us feel better, usually at the price. Some may do genuine good and bring about a lasting relief to particular problems we are burdened with. They may show us a way forward that really helps and turn out to be friends in need. But rarely, if ever, can our helpers and advisors lead us to that position where we can declare, I have found perfect happiness, perfect peace. Or, I know that true inner joy which nothing can mar and which needs nothing outside for its rise or it, its continuance. Yet such testimonies are found in the words of those who have awakened fully to the deeper significance of their own true being and have realized their self as that which transcends all misery and limitations. But whatever remedy or advice is available to us, the effectiveness of our treatment depends on us. Our attitude, flexibility, our wish to evolve and willingness to follow instruction. Our response to psychological aid of any kind depends on our will and cooperation. We may respond very well to a path of inner development, but the key factor is neither the teachings nor the teacher, but ourselves. That is, those reserves of character that are drawn up within us. If we are helped, it is because of our own response, our own need and our own efforts. So how deeply rooted are the reserves of character and higher wisdom that are treasured within our own being. We said that in order to be peaceful and happy, there is an absolute solution, which is different from the tentative support we get from friends and helpers. The real scope and richness of our inner resources is only brought to light with the help of those who have themselves discovered the deeper truth about their own being. In reality, our inner resources and hidden wealth have no boundary. They belong to what one teacher has called that region 
of self-experience which knows no horizon. There is infinity hidden in the finite, immortality at the source of our mortal personality. The root of the mind and emotions, the source of our inner life is in the transcendent. We can prove this to ourselves through practice and inner inquiry. The life and consciousness in us is not separate from the great life that underlies the whole cosmos. Let us take an illustration from nature. The sea water trapped in a rock pool seems to be a little world of its own, unrelated to the great sea. A child may even believe that we can revisit the pool tomorrow and that it will be filled with the same water. But the water really has no limited individualized identity. It is one with the sea and will merge with the sea once the tide rolls back in. So too, our individual life is ever at one with the infinite non-dual reality and is destined to realize its oneness with the all. Thus our inner resources have their origin in something that is far deeper than the material, mental or intellectual planes. These planes of experience are compared to outer coverings. What do they apparently cover is the central light as our being, the central light of our being, the nameless, the infinite, the reality, pure consciousness. This is the true inner wealth, the foundation of peace and the home of happiness. Through following a certain way of self-training, the obstacles to inner peace and happiness are slowly dissolved. As a spring of water jets forth, once the obstacles of stones and earth have been removed, so too the tranquil bliss of our higher nature penetrates our mind more and more as we make a clear channel for the light and peace of our real self to manifest in our being. This indwelling presence is called by many names, the infinite, the true self, the Godhead. Its realization leads to fulfillment. While we are psychologically cut off from this realization of our own innate freedom, we're like someone who has lost the key to their own home. Missing this self-knowledge, the peace and happiness we long for will always elude us. The mind becomes happy when it comes into contact with the source of ultimate happiness. That source is our true self. So what is the force that can effect this greatest discovery of all? It is the force of our desires, if we direct them rightly. Everyone has a right to desire the highest fulfillment. This thirst for expansion of consciousness is what drives us through all our attempts to achieve something in life. But it takes much experiment and experience to recognize that the absolute solution to our need for peace and delight is not to be found in the material world. 
or in the field of intellectual knowledge and power. Our true fulfillment can only come through our identification with the infinite reality in our own being. As we said before, we can transform our mind into an instrument of peace and freedom if this is what we really want, if we're willing to take the steps to make the effort. We can't afford to be like the man who prayed to God every day that he might win the lottery and then complained that he never did. A voice from above called out, at least buy a ticket. So our higher aspiration, our higher aspirations are unrewarding unless we for our part are willing to make a start and a continuance in our self-training. Self-examination is helpful. This means that we occasionally pause in our activities, turn within and calmly look, so to say, at the contents and tendencies of our own mind. And what we need to do is to see how far our thoughts have been helpful to our inner development. If we feel this hasn't been the case, then we have a chance to use our intelligence and experience to make inner adjustments that will contribute to our further advance to inner illumination. The practice of self-examination is liberating liberating because it enables us to witness the mental activities and not be lost in a sense of total identification with them for ultimately our self is independent of the mind and its movements if we practice meditation it will help us to step back a little and get an objective and freer view of our inner life. How many troubles would be avoided if we can only learn to pause in our tracks and ponder in this way? This is how we get to know our mind better and find that we can consider things in a wider perspective. And I think it's a good time to just pause for a minute or two and reflect on the following. Um, I am the power which guides the mind, the source of peace, happiness and freedom is within me. I am the power which guides the mind. The source of peace, happiness and freedom is within me. Om. Um, <clears throat> this love of the infinity that underlies our own being is the only love that will never fail us because its object is everlasting. This deeper reality is ever present whether we realize it or not. In the traditional teachings of the non-dual Vedanta, which have their source in the Upanishads, this infinite reality is called Brahm or Brahman, 
a Sanskrit word denoting immeasurable greatness. It may be translated as the absolute, a word that suggests wholeness, perfection, oneness, or rather non-duality. It is that which is the ultimate reality. It is the source of the existence of all existent things. The Brahman is also the source of all knowledge, and hence it is referred to as consciousness absolute. This same cosmic consciousness and indestructible existence is the innermost nature of every human being. This is the infinity hidden in the finite, and it is our true self. All other aspects of experience, the vast spread of forms and the names we apply to them to create some order and integration for our life in the world, the entire realm of name and form is considered as superficial compared to the reality of Brahman. It is superficial because it changes all the time. And because to those who have awakened to the reality of Brahman, the seeming reality of the world appearance is totally undermined. Self-realization, to realize oneself as infinite consciousness, exposes the illusory nature of everything in our experience that appears before us, either as sense data or as thought. And each of us can awaken our sensitivity to this great source of relief, upliftment, and ultimately, the wisdom of the deepest self-knowledge. Having stressed the abstract nature of the Absolute as one without a second, the teachings also show how we may, if we like, contemplate Brahm or Brahman as the divine principle or God referred to in the religions of the world. In preparing us for our approach to the highest, the Upanishads teach Brahman as the cause of the world appearance from whom the universe has come forth and in which it abides. Our mind will always find help through this approach to what it conceives as a living, loving power. As it says in the Bible, one is alone, but not alone. Actually, one is never alone. Or one could say that from the highest standpoint, one is always alone. For if the inf infinite is our true nature, that true nature is ultimately the great and complete reality that underlies all experience. So we are alone in the sublime sense indicated in an ancient text and it's in the Chandogya Upanishad. The infinite is that where one does not see anything else, one does not hear anything else, one does not understand anything else. That which indeed is the infinite is immortal. And the ensuing verses state, that this infinite is our true self. The peak of our evolution is to awaken to this self-knowledge, the knowledge of the infinity of our own being, of the identity of our innermost self, not with our mind, but with the infinite Brahman. And the path to this realization is one that comes to light 
in our own being. It unfolds within us as a higher kind of knowledge. This knowledge does not reside in the mind as an object that is known and is separate from us. It dissolves the difference between knower, knowledge and known. The conviction, if it can be indicated by words at all, is one ocean of consciousness exists, infinite, all light, all bliss ever abiding, that am I. In the Jandogya Upanishad, we hear how the pupil Narad goes to the teacher Sanat Kumara, one who is a knower of the self. And he approaches him with the traditional words, Atihi Bhagavan, teach me, venerable sir. The teacher addresses him, tell me what you know already. I will tell you what lies beyond what you know. Narad is a man of learning and he tells of the many subjects in which he had gained expertise. Friends, our knowledge may be extensive, but how does it contribute to our peace of heart, our happiness? Does it soothe and delight us when we are alone with ourselves without outer support? Narad's answer to this is that such knowledge acquired from books and tuition does not help at all to cure the deep restlessness of the human heart. Oh, venerable sir, he confesses, I know these subjects intellectually, as one knows from books, but I'm not a knower of the self. And I have heard that the knower of self goes beyond sorrow. Such as I am, I'm full of sorrow. Oh, venerable sir, take me beyond sorrow. The teacher explains that Nara's knowledge may be useful up to a point, but he will never escape from limitations and sorrow as long as his understanding is rooted in the ever-changing realm of appearances, the realm of names and forms. There is a higher knowledge that is perfectly satisfying and has no limits. Although this knowledge cannot be expressed in words, there is a path to its realization and it can be verified in one's own experience. All your knowledge, the sage explains to Narad, depends on words. It would be nothing if your mind was not crammed with the names of the things you have learned about. So all names, all words, apply to the limited and ever-changing form of experience, not to the ultimate reality. At the back of all names and forms is something more, and it is the real source of all the richness and multiplicity we find in the universe. That something more is the divine essence, the Brahman, the Absolute. It is this subtle essence that enables the objects to exist, that analyze the entire multiplicity of forms and makes them seem real and possessed of qualities. This essence is infinite and it is one in all. The advice is to meditate in such a way that one intuitively sees through or sees behind, so to speak, the screen of names and forms, and rests in the idea of their common essence as pure being. That is, we we'll learn to meditate on that deeper reality, which is at the back of names and forms, and which is ever present. So it's present everywhere. 
There is only one universal and supreme principle, that is the absolute Brahman. And the sage Sanat Kumara then gives the instruction, meditate on name is not separate from Brahman, which underlies it. Meditate on name as Brahman. The implication in the Upanishad is that Narad then withdraws in order to reflect deeply through meditation on this whole realm of things which are denoted by their names. Now, Narad is empowered to say to anything that appears in his mind, you just a name. Your essence is Brahman. Brahman only. Om. Such a form of meditation will also reduce the mind's tendency to flit rapidly from point to point. Normally, when the name of something or somebody arises in our mind, the form and qualities we associate with that person or thing also enter into our thought. And this, in turn, instantly links with other objects of thought and memory. And so our thinking becomes an endless chain. This sequence of thoughts usually escapes our scrutiny and appears to have a life and power of its own. But the meditation on name as Brahman shifts our focus from the superficial flow of transient thoughts to the immutable ground of pure being on which all thoughts are superimposed phenomenally. Our mind is thus held back from the free play of memory and imagination, and its energy is conserved and channeled into the in-depth inquiry to penetrate the source of being and not its passing manifestation. Eventually, Narad returns to the teacher and asks if there is anything greater than name. The teacher tells him, indeed there is. It is speech. For it is speech that makes known anything that has a name. Sanat Kumara explains to Narad that all his knowledge of the many subjects he has mastered has come to him through the medium of speech. And he adds, if speech were not there, there would be no knowledge of virtue and vice, truth and falsehood, good and bad, pleasant and unpleasant. Surely, speech makes all this known. Meditate on speech. He who meditates on speech as Brahman, the Absolute, acquires freedom of movement as far as the range of speech extends. Narad is told to meditate on speech as Brahman. Once again, instead of being absorbed in the mind's surface activity, his attention is drawn to the general and universal principle called speech, and also to the divine power which pervades all speech the underlying power of Brahman, through which all speech is made possible. Narad is thus equipped with a new way of contemplating experience. It is intended to lift his mind above particulars, and it produces an expansion of consciousness. He is being taught through philosophical reflection to rise above his individuality and to see that the forces and the principles that govern his life, like name and speech, are universal ones that have their being in Brahman. Then the sage Sanat Kumara tells him that mind is higher than speech, will greater than mind, 
intelligence is superior to will and takes him through a whole hierarchy of principles that he should meditate on. Always the meditation involves taking the principle, universalizing it, and meditating on the essence of the experience, the power that makes it possible, taking that power as Brahman. Despite this expansion of consciousness, Narad is still pursuing his quest as a finite individual. There is still the division, me and my knowledge. The universe he experiences is still divided up into sections. It is not non-dual, and in the words of another Upanishad, where there is duality, there is fear. The ultimate quest is for that knowledge which will expand our feeling of selfhood beyond all limitations and will reveal the identity of the self as Brahman, the Absolute. And the final set of meditations prescribed by Sanat Kumara brings this about. Narad is now told that he must submerge his mind in a principle that has no worldly characteristics at all. Nothing that encloses it, nothing that divides it up. That principle is the infinite. Here at last is the secret of true joy. And in the words of the Holy Sage, that which indeed is the infinite, that is joy. There is no joy in the finite. The infinite alone is joy. But the infinite indeed has to be sought after. And Narad responds, O oh, Venerable Sir, I seek after the infinite. The sage then teaches Narad that when the infinite is truly known, there will be no division between ourself and it. No split into knower, knowledge, and known. This is the real knowledge that completely fills experience and washes away grief, fear, and longing forever. This is joy absolute. And to repeat the verse quoted earlier, the infinite is that where one does not see anything else, does not hear anything else, and does not understand anything else. Hence, the finite is that where one sees something else, hears something else, understands something else. That which indeed is the infinite, that is immortal. But that which is finite is mortal. Narad then asks, Venerable Sir, on what is the infinite established? And the sage answers, In its own glory, or not even in its own glory. In other words, no description can do justice to the grandeur of the infinite, non-dual truth that transcends language and the normal processes of thought. Friends, do you want joy and fulfillment? Do you want to end fear forever? Whether it is fear of anything or anybody, or fear that is to do with our own imagined weaknesses or weakness or inadequacy. The only solution is to know through direct experience our own self to be the infinite. 
And the whole purpose of the yoga of self-knowledge is the achievement of final freedom. There is a knowledge that will unlock this mystery. This knowledge manifests when our mind has been controlled and purified. It is then that our higher powers of intuition and inspiration, normally dormant, become operative and open the way to the freedom of enlightenment. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.